So sorry, I, so you need to introduce. Yeah, so yeah, actually, I'm going to introduce Joe okay. because because for two reasons. Because one, so Joe is trained with Hashim uh, Alashim, who many of you know, but couldn't be here because of an illness in his family. He was going to be here. So that was Joe to start, and then Joe's now, as I'm sure you'll say, in yeah. three years out. So he's like a incestuous. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, yeah. which may explain something. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I was going to say that. So yeah. Uh, <laughs>
we know that this is not what RNA normally looks like. We want to, I at least want to come up with a technique that will allow us to be more general in the type of RNAs we can make. And just to tell you why we want to do this, here's like these three examples of RNA being used uh, for en engineering applications, but they were done through manual modeling without computer-assisted uh, techniques. So we could like uh, organize uh, cellular pathways together by attaching them together with RNA. This was to increase the hydrogen production uh, production pathway, tethering the ribosome into a single-stranded ribosome, um, which could be used for cell-free uh, and synthetic biology, and then increasing the affinity of aptamers by linking them together. These three cases, there was this tons of trial and error uh, to get to the answer, but if we have the tools available through some kind of computational modeling, which I'm alluding to that I'll be talking about, uh, we, we, we could solve them in a much quicker way. But ultimately where I want to go is uh, RNA, uh, I mean, Dan Hogan talked a little bit about it, but they, I, I, there's a whole field of using RNA for therapeutic <laughs> applications. I'm showing some of the older ones, the angiozyme, which is unfortunately did not make through clinical trials, but a uh, way of cutting RNA, uh, and the macrogen, which is an aptamer for binding uh, VEG1. Um, it's an aptamer um, that you can in vitro select. There's a whole opportunity, I think, for the therapeutic applications of RNA, and I, I personally, right now, won't be able to do it, but I think developing the ability to rationally design RNA will lead, uh, will be part of the solution to getting to much broader landscape of RNA therapeutics. So, to describe what I did, I uh, developed RNA Make. This is an automated tool for assembling new structures of RNA. Uh, it takes a huge library, a motif from the PDB. I effectively just chopped up the whole PDB. Um, and then I combined it with this automated uh, pathfinding algorithm inspired by uh, an ASTAR uh, pathfinding search. You put those together, and you have a way of building an arbitrary path in, of, of RNA. So to first test this algorithm, we went back to this tension potential receptor. And instead of using symmetry to I flip over, excuse me, to flip over the tetral tetral receptor into symmetry, we want a way of creating a single strand that's going to hold lock this tetral tetral receptor in place um, that will fold into place. So that will demonstrate that the RNA path we created, uh, we can read out whether this tetral tetral receptor has evidence that our, our model is correct. So here, here's an example of what like a final solution will look like. So RNA make it starts with a start base pair, it gets to an end base pair, and it assembles base uh, uh, helices with motifs from uh, this large set, uh, this large motif library to build a final path. This is like showing it in reverse effectively. It's you know it's trying many, many possibilities and it will get to a final structure like this. Um, there were many, many possible solutions, but we picked 16 to experimentally test. Uh, it's color-coded. Each motif is a uh, unique color, so you can see there's a huge variation of possibilities. Um, but you know, you want to actually test to make sure these are folding. We just don't, don't want to just do it on the computer for the fun of it. Um, so we uh, use a, a set of biological uh, biochemical tests where we first looked at the each construct with a GAAA tetra loop, uh, which binds the tetra loop receptor. And then we put a UUCG knockout and we ran these both on a native gel with the idea that with the UUCG is going to be flopping all around, not forming this tertiary contact, and will run slower on the gel. So we did this for all 16, and you can see a majority of them, you can see these effects. Uh, five of them you cannot, but it's a pretty good success rate. Uh, we further uh, wants to understand the stability of this tertiary contact. So we looked at magnesium titrations for a, a, a few of them. And uh, we were looking at uh, DMS reactivity of the tetra, tetra receptor A's. So we know uh, with low magnesium, this tertiary contact cannot form. As you add more magnesium, uh, it becomes uh, stable and thus uh, is protected from magnesium. So you can see this nice curve for P46. But we can see for three of them, we have an even stronger effect uh, from 
magnesium, suggesting uh, that they're incredible, uh, they're quite stable. Um, and even though the E4 P6 has two tetra, uh, sorry, two uh, tertiary contacts, uh, many TKR2 and 16 are more stable with uh, less residues and only one tertiary contact. And many TTR6 has an extremely sharp dependence, uh, sharper than P4 P6 for magnesium. Um, going on, there is one mention of stuff that Dan and his lab did. Uh, we did small angle x ray scattering. Uh, Joey Song from uh, uh, Dan's lab did this for mini TTR2 and 6, and we got envelopes that we put our mo uh, models in, and you can see they suggest that they're monomers and very similar to uh, the, the model for two and six. But ultimately, with Jeff Keefe's group at uh, UC Denver, we solved the crystal structure of mini TTR6. And here's our model, and here's uh, the X-ray structure. And you can see many parts of them are, are very uh, similar. So the touch loop touch receptor is almost comically accurate. Uh, well, it is comically accurate. Right? It's almost identical. Um, <coughs> where the major source of error between them is this one motif um, in our initial model, uh, the uh, RNA model, these residues are flipped out, but then in the X-ray crystal structure in white, they're flipped back in. And this is most likely a, a accounted for proteins it was interacting with, uh, which we didn't have in the crystal structure. Um, so you've got to be really careful which motifs you use. But the, uh, these other two, uh, this IRS domain two, very sharp bend, very, very similar between the, our model and the crystal structure. And then this uh, kink turn, also extremely similar. You can even see this flipped out residue. This isn't even a contact, and it's almost identical. So very, very uh, exciting. But we didn't want to just make nanostructure. We wanted to uh, create RNAs that did something. So I'm, uh, I can't talk about all of the things uh, we ended up doing, but I just want to highlight this one, I think, key thing that we can do to improve, uh, uh, that we can take uh, RNA aptamers, so these are RNAs that I uh, use in vitro selection to bind to a specific target protein, a biomarker, uh, biomarker ligand, metabolite, and through successive uh, rounds of selection, you can get things that bind very tightly. But after uh, the initial selection, there's no way to further improve them. So what we uh, what we're showing uh, what we came up with was a way to once we take it uh, once we have an existing aptamer, a way to use rational design to improve them. So here's just quickly what we thought up. So here's the ATP aptamer. Uh, our hypothesis that is when ATP binds, uh, there is conformational entropy cost of binding. It's extremely flexible. It's a, a nine nine one bulge. Um, so our idea is if we scaffolded this aptamer in the bound-like conformation, then it would pay less cost of uh, binding free, uh, free energy um, conformational entropy. So I'll just briefly uh, cover the two systems we, uh, went, uh, we looked over. Uh, we use the ATP aptamer and then the spinach fluorescent aptamer. And again, what we're doing is we're building a scaffold around them with the tetra receptor to hold these aptamers in the bound-like conformation that we got from a crystal structure or NMR structure. So for the ATP aptamer, we, uh, three of our 10 uh, constructs, we had a, a significant increase in binding affinity. Uh, sorry, I don't have the binding affinities listed here, but the aptamer alone, which is in black, is about 19.1 uh, micromolar, uh, and uh, ATP, uh, 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 ATP TTR2 uh, 5, uh, tetra tetra receptor 5, is about tenfold more stable, um, with the others being uh, like 9 and 5. Um, so, again, all we're doing, we're taking the exact same sequence of the uh, ATP after and is encasing it in this larger structure. So, the fact that we can get a tenfold increase in binding thing simply through this, it's an extremely generalizable idea that we could uh, do on other, uh, other aptamers. So we went and did it on the spinach, the spinach uh, after. So again, we just encased it in this uh, scaffold. And what we showed is, this is its uh, GFP analog. We showed that they were uh, three of them were brighter than both uh, spinach and broccoli, which is an improved um, spinach. And uh, through both uh, ligand and RNA concentration, uh, 
titration. And then, very surprisingly, when we put them in uh, cellular lysate, 20% cellular lysate, they seem to be and they live much longer uh, if we're examined by fluorescence. So while broccoli and spinach just die off very quickly, these ones with the tetralib tetral receptor seem to last much longer. So that's also very encouraging. Um, so just finally, I just wanted, I, I, am a, I'm a, I am in the process of applying for faculty positions, so I just wanted to highlight where I think this work can go. So of course, I've heard so many times, <laughs> <laughs> what is your plan um, from Dan? And I, you know, I have spent a lot of time thinking about it. And uh, if we go back to this, the ATP aptamer, uh, what I've shown you is that you can encase it in the scaffold, scaffold to increase the binding effect uh, through reducing conformational entropy. But I think you can go further and you can add to this scaffold and increase the, bind, uh, the binding affinity through new binding interactions uh, using rational design. So here's a, here's a mock-up model of the binding, uh, binding pocket. So I'm suggesting adding new residues that can come in. So that's one project. I'm also thinking of creating these little claws <coughs> where you're using A minor interactions to recognize specific motifs. Um, so uh, for example, this tetralib tetra receptor again, there's tons of tetralib tetra receptors throughout this uh, not coding RNAs. So here would be a way to, if you connect all these A minor interactions into a single RNA, you can attach them to beads and pull down all RNAs that have this shape. Um, and lastly, I'm looking into the uh, idea of using both selection and rational design to build RNAs that could block protein-protein interactions as potential therapeutics, or bring them together to set off, uh, uh, set off, uh, to bring them to the proteasome, where there's like an E3 lipase and an RNA you want, a uh, protein you want as a grade. So that's it. Uh, thanks again for reading you so much uh, for uh, uh, helping me uh, develop these projects. Uh, thank you to uh, research assistant Ale Alexandra, who is in the lab, uh, and then Anne for helping me with lots of experiments. Thank you to Jeff for helping me with crystallography, and of course, Dan, thank you so much for helping me with the small angle X ray scattering and helping me with so much of my work here. Thank you very much.
I guess along the same line. So each motif in your sort of algorithm has always the same sequence. I mean, yes. There must be. I mean, there are many sequences that perform the same motif. I mean, maybe well, not many. But well, I'm not. I'm not sure about. That. I mean, some of them. Like, for instance, King Turn. King Turn. King Turn is a good example. Yeah, yeah that's so the only I way represent way. each King Turn as a separate motif. So if it has a separate sequence, it's mm -hmm. a separate motif in this scheme. But in theory, you could group them together yeah, like that. I mean, I'm sure that's very difficult, or maybe it's difficult, but principally you could do sort of some optimization that at each motif you do some optimized things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, this was just like the the uh, most simplistic way of doing it, but I am, of course, looking into ways uh, to improve. Uh, one, uh, one other thing that I haven't really counted is just adding a little flexibility per motif. I'm not I'm these as rigid blocks, but uh, some, more uh, some work I didn't really talk about I actually allow things to flex a little, and it really increases like the type of solutions I can create. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, can, can these RNAs be used in vivo? For example, do they co-efficiency and efficiency in vivo, and are they reasonably stable, or what would we have to do in order to make them co and? Yeah. So, I mean, so for the aftermers, I was showing uh, this was this was in uh, in cell life state, so they they could be stable. Of course, like they're going to degrade. I mean. I, in a hundred percent cell life they degrade very quickly, so you probably need to do some of those modifications that we were talking talked about earlier um, to allow them to live longer, um, or to you know have them being sure crowded off a plasma or something to keep regenerating. So yeah, so my idea for like the drug therapeutics, I, I would suppose you would definitely have to uh, hyper modify them to to use them as drugs. If you'd want them to exist inside the cell at any reasonable amount of concentration. Yeah. Okay, so this. So, if I can just, just sort of give a, sort of put a couple of things, put one thing together, which is what Anita talked about with clustering different sequences. So, it's straightforward to, and I think actually MAVA somehow has the data for all the king turn sequences. Yeah. So, one can see whether their thermodynamic fingerprints are the same or different and say which ones are going to all behave the same, and then even begin to put in the ones that yep. are different in this to see what their, what their differences are. So they're really complementary approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank you all the speakers.